Thank you, Janne, and Anne Inves, indeed, was exactly the thought I had in mind. Thank you for all, all of you for your wonderful uh, presentations. Few remarks of the background that I tried to make remarks or comments. I am the director of the newly established Rule of Law Center at the University of Helsinki at the Law Faculty. So, so of course, when when one drives with the horses, one talk talks about the horses and comes from that angle to to this discussion. And before I make my comments, when it comes to rule of law, there is exactly that same kind of debate going on as with democracy. That, particularly after Afghanistan, the question is that I mean, what, what, it was at least two billion dollars that was spent by, only by the World Bank to increase the rule of law, the principle of rule of law in Afghanistan, and. How did it turn out? And maybe the latest report, if you want to have a closer look, uh, is done by the, the Court of Auditors in EU, in Luxembourg, uh, and it involves the rule of law work done in Western Balkans. So we are not at the very highest, uh, the lowest level of development vis-a-vis -vis the, the presentations we heard today. But nevertheless, the work done by EU or financed by EU Commission in Western Balkan, according to that latest report. It's one, number one uh, from this year in the Court of Auditors, if you want to have a closer look, estimated that in general the impact of the 700 uh, million euros spent in that region between 2014 to 2020 the impact was close to zero in some of the cases, but in very similar cases, it did make a difference to a better, but in, in worst cases, it actually uh, sort of a, was a negative impact due to the uh, limp, uh, due to the course that it enhances or it, it helped the court system or the strengthened the, the institutions in the legal world while missing that the whole country or the basic attitudes of the leaders and the political system was illicit or wasn't democratic enough. They were not buying it. So, so it turned out that with this aid you were helping a court that looks like a court to be more effective using IT systems better, but the whole grounding, for example, when it comes to corruption, didn't change. So this is the sort of angle I was listening to in your presentations today, because there is more and more questions and debate, even some studies already asking about this triangle of rule of law, democracy, and human rights. And what is their role in, in developing in general, but also that which one comes first at which stage when you are trying to help a country to develop itself. Quite often there have been de debates, also I have to reveal you to, together with Janne, that is there a possibility that we should discuss and study more closely if we bring up elections to, at the two uh, early stage in a country, that there isn't really actual room for that. And then we start to play along as if this is real democracy, and as if the structures we are building upon these elections are the real ones. And that's quite easy to point out in Afghanistan, but right now we as a center, we are also going to sample experts concerning Somalia around the issue, that what are we talking about when we are trying to, maybe in the future, to help to build up rule of law, that based on what what are the main groundings and what, how, how should we scrutinize whether this is real, whether the, the, the stakeholders or the actors are actually legitimate 
even though it's through the election systems that we have sort of brought into the country. So this is the way I'm now saying few comments on the excellent speeches. Uh, first of all, of, of Eric, I, I think it was it was really a relief to hear that this is it's similarly difficult to study when it comes to to this economic growth vis-à-vis -vis aid, as it is with with the building up uh, rule of law and the volatility and the fact that you could define that there are differences from various sources also when it comes to this phase is that there is a rapid growth or there isn't growth at all and how difficult it seemed to be find any clear answers or patterns so that you would go and say one size fits all. That is I think the most valuable outcome of it all and also reminds me that when we need similar studies as we heard that has been done on, on democracy when it comes to rule of law that these backgrounds or what are the factors we are looking at, needs to be similar way done when it comes to ev economic development of the country. In quite many of these studies that did the rule of law work actually work or did it do anything, there's almost a lack of ev economic background studies. And when I was listening to your studies, I thought that once again, I, I think that without that kind of a economic background studies, you cannot really estimate development. And then what Anke Hofland was saying us was also, I was listening once again, that this evidence is mixed. And it seems to be quite difficult, but when you noticed, uh, when you showed up this circle of development and the leg legitimacy of, was questioned kind of a part was there that that's how it's that you need to take into account that if there is that the legitimacy of a nation or or the governments is questioned that seems to be a really relevant actor in this whole circle of development that is exactly the same thing we are now looking forward a week ago the prime minister of estonia mrs kallas was here at helsinki I, I, she was visiting the Bar Association in Finland and she told from her own experience that how come Estonia developed from zero to zero in all the ways, economic, democracy, rule of law, human rights, within 13 years as being one of the examples of great success. When, for example, when it comes to corruption, that they, now they are right after the Nordic countries in Transparency International lists. And she pointed out that immediately and very rapidly after the independence, this legitimacy of the government that this is our country, this is our things, turned into a mindset of the people that helped to turn out everything else. And one of the questions I think that we should have a closer look in all of these aspects you were talking about is that how is this mindset awareness raising, particularly when there are so many young people in these countries, can be attacked. And when it comes to education, now this is all already remarked to your wonderful uh, uh, presentation was also that when we are talking about education, how much do we actually study and pay attention to that within the education there should be strong emphasis on awareness raising to, towards democracy, rule of law, taking control of, of your own matters, towards anti-corruption. Otherwise, we might end up building younger generations to an attitude that the education is my pathway to being one of those that I've been seeing repressing the lower ones. That is just sort of taking care of me and my family in order to help ours without this part of being partly of, of the whole curriculum, rule of law, anti-corruption. And then my final remarks, I'm looking at the timetable also, when, when it comes to Henrik, was that if you look at the, uh, the, the one, the, the, sorry, the, the uh, 
now I got, I forgot the, with the youth and the urbanization, yes, that was the thing. I'm not sure whether we have understood when it comes to rule of law or democracy also that the urbanization part has been taken seriously. In quite many literature we are talking about former tribe courts and sort of trying to build up on those as a, an alternative or all the mistakes we have done when, when trying to bring a Nordic or a Western rule of law method into a country that the alternative would be this old tribal courts and let's start to build upon that. That that world doesn't exist. Not that, to, at least to, not, to that extent as it should be. So I thank you for that as well. And from Rachel, there was so much I, I loved about what you were saying. And my final conclusion is that when thinking about the outcome of the rule of law, let's go back to this audit, the court of auditors recent report 1.22, what they stated was that it seems that if it's not long-standing, if it's only two or four years in a row processes, it doesn't work. If it doesn't pay attention severely and really deeply into civil society and freedom of press and capacity of free press to actually control and scrutinize the power and the, the sort of a commitment of the country and particularly of the rulers, it doesn't work at all. So what we heard today about that you need, you need to want peace badly. My last conclusion is after hearing you, you also need to scrutinize whether the current rulers or the stakeholders of the country really want rule of law, anti-corruption, Badly. And if you have doubts about that, I think you should have another look before entering just doing what we have done so far, because there's quite a lot of evidence that what we have, we have done so far isn't effective enough. It seems to look good, but it doesn't really try to be as effective as it can. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Tuya, and I'll now invite all the panel to join me here, that I'm not sitting here alone, uh, looking sad. And while the panel is moving here, I'll challenge all of you to put forward questions. Uh, for me, I am, please join me, I am really struck by the two things, the dynamic picture the panelists have been able to draw with the economic uh, migration, demographic, really, and then the question they are putting to us, are our interventions effective in, in that dynamic picture that they have, uh, they have drawn? But now questions, well, the panel is here. Ladies in the center, first here with the pink jacket, please. Thank you so much. This was an excellent panel. Um, you all kind of touch upon a lot of like dynamics that seem to be highly relevant to understand, um, but most of the analyses were focused kind of on a national level. So I was wondering to which extent you could improve your analyses to really understand the mechanisms driving these like really complex interactions by looking more closely at the subnational level and what is going on. So for instance, on the paper from Eric and Kunal on the growth episodes and fragility, um, for instance, like one of the main things that I was thinking is like how is growth actually distributed across space, across groups, to really understand how these like episodes of growth link back to fragility because of course if there's high growth episodes but these are then centered in like certain spaces, for instance if you look at Mozambique which we talked about earlier, it was really highly centered in like areas that were already um, in favor and marginalized areas were left behind, which I think is like one of the key drivers also of the dynamics we see right now. And then the same with um, aid and fragility, where does aid actually flow in space in which communities are favored? And then also to understand, for instance, what Tuja was uh, talking about earlier, the rule of law, um, there's like different dynamics that are happening and it also during conflict, for instance, um, are set up is like different levels of rule of law, different actors that become highly relevant and how can we do a better job of understanding and supporting these like local efforts to actually drive rule of law and understand also what kind of um, 
concepts do people in this country or across different communities within that country understand to help them better? And I think that might be a way to improve these analyses. And, and so could, could, oh. you, could you introduce yourself? Of course, I forgot. <laughs> Hi, my name is Laura Saavedra Lux. I'm a new research associate here at WIDER, actually. I just joined a few weeks ago. Thank you. Uh, the, and then I'll remind you we have a hard deadline at one o'clock. So my intention is to gather a few questions, short ones I hope, uh, and then give the panel one shot, each of them. So I think we will need one minute each. So we have three minutes to have questions and then five minutes to have answers. So next, please. Thank you. I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, my name is Katarina Mustasilda. I work for the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. I would have many questions. The panel was so excellent. Thank you very, uh, very much, everyone. But I will uh, direct my question to Rachel. Uh, I thought it was really interesting, the studies that you went through in terms of democracy aid. None of the studies that you reviewed were actually budget aid. Um, and I wanted to ask if, if you know about this, how much of the democracy aid de facto goes to indeed projects and, and what type of projects um, and how much of it goes to budget aid. And, and, and related to that, uh, we saw that Swedish or Sweden's democracy aid indeed uh, seemed to be particularly good uh, in, in terms of the significant positive impact. So could you tell us a little bit more about the nature of uh, Swedish aid, democracy aid? Thanks. I have two gentlemen in, in two sides, and then uh, at, at the back uh, with the with the great jacket, please. And then next we'll yeah go ahead. Or thanks yeah. for the presentation. So um, my question is particularly for Eric, but maybe also for the other presenters. I missed a bit, Eric, the relationship to what we call the institutional uh, setup of a country and how does it relate to, to fragility. The reason is because many economists today are convinced that what you need for long-term growth is stable institutions. And, and so uh, how would you see your work on the fragility index? How does that relate to the institutional uh, literature? Thank you. Thank you. And then the other side. And if it's the short one, we might still have one. <laughs> there is conditionality here. Thank you. I'm Andy Hinsley from the UK's Foreign Commonwealth Development Office. So linked to this question about on-budget aid, uh, possible tension between state capability uh, and um, aid effectiveness. So the aid effectiveness agenda um, from the Paris 2005 uh, agreement suggests that aid should flow to government systems to build capability of those systems. But we heard this morning in the opening session about the importance of grassroots or Chris Blackman's recent book on why we fight emphasizes that you need to you need decentralization, you need to move away from centralization of powers, as, which is a big cause of, of, of fragility. So is there a tension between uh, objectives around building state capability and, and aid effectiveness with uh, fragility in, in how we use aid. Looking, uh, th there is a one, oh, let's take one here. Uh, that comes from a uh, uh, kind of a chat, chat question. We need to have one, so go ahead. And this is the last one, sorry, and I want to give the panel time to answer. Thank you. So there is a question by Nicolas Ouma to Henrik. As a pathway out of fragility, have there been interventions with regards to youth skill development, especially in technical and vocational education and training? Have these been evaluated for impact? And it's also open to the panel if someone else wanna say something. Thank you. Thank you, and I'll now put it back to the panel. All the panelists have, will have one minute before the deadline, so we will start with Eric and, and go with that order. Go ahead, please. Okay, um, thank you for the questions. Uh, these are wonderful. Um, with respect to Lara's questions ar around subnational growth, uh, in our in our theoretical framework and with the case studies, we don't look at subnational from a geographic perspective, but we do from the distribution of business and business interests. And we argue and find in country case studies that when high growth accrues to countries or companies rather that make their profits through their relationship with government discretionary regulatory rents, then that can lead to the consolidation of perhaps an illegitimate political settlement 
and result in growth with less legitimacy and investments in state capacity. Looking uh, geographically is a really interesting idea. And then Philip's question around institutions, I think that's also fascinating. Again, part of the argument for the earlier book was that when you look at how institutions predict future economic growth or whether if you improve institutions, how much, whether you'll get a better growth episode, it turns out there's very little correlation at that level looking forward. And so our argument that something else other than institutions drives growth at the level of the growth episode in the medium run. And therefore, uh, looking at fragile countries, we also find that both high growth and low growth emerge under weak institutions. So we need to look beyond that. Anke, please. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, Laura, for your question on subnational, are you looking at the subnational level? So, there's some really interesting work by Leonson, Kumana, and, and co authors. So, does health aid give you health? And they look at, you know, what happens around health facilities. Yeah. Now, this fragility aid is a bit more difficult to sort, of, and, and it does. Yeah. And I think this is a very useful um, direction. This aid literature is is taking on aid effectiveness. Now, fragility is a sort of state concept. Yeah. We measure this for states. And I think we aren't quite there yet to sort of really look at fragility in more in the micro context. Tilman Brück and co-authors just had something in the review of development economics on sort of looking exactly at, at fragility from the micro perspective. What does it actually mean for people to live in, in a fragile uh, environment? So I think we are going there, but we are not there yet. And thank you for your suggestion. Very briefly on Katarina's on aid allocation. So there's a big aid allocation literature. And actually, when you look at it, so, uh, you know, it's recipient need. Yeah, these countries are poor. There's also merit, you know, only if you democratize will you get money and, and human rights and so on. And of course, donor self-interest. And then also some proximity factors. Very little aid is allocated according to recipient, what I'd call merit very little. There's lots of talk, and when you actually look at it, very little allocated. Thank you. Hendrik. Thanks to, to Nicholas' question uh, on, on technical vocational training. That's not something we've looked at specifically, but, but we'll be looking at it uh, in, in this uh, extension project. Uh, just want to say very briefly on, on the uh, uh, disaggregated um, aid um, literature there is there is as i'm sure many knows about the aid data research consortium very interesting uh, results coming out of that including on chinese aid and corruption that uh, that for those of you interested in in democracy should check out and, and we've also in a new study now found that there is some interesting uh, divergence between uh, nordic countries and netherlands and, and other countries uh, in terms of uh, sort of needs based approaches where, where we find that nordic countries and netherlands are actually reaching the poor uh, and, and needy to a greater degree than, than other donors. Okay, thank you. Um, I think I'll start with Katarina's question about aid modalities. And this is, um, as Anka mentioned, it's a really important literature. And I think there's a lot of uh, strong views on the best ways to provide aid. I mean, our, our data suggests that um, uh, the vast majority of, of aid, democracy aid, by our limited definition, goes to project support. Um, but as you as you pointed out, the, the evidence is is not so clear on on what aid modality works best. And I think you've you've clearly you're pointing to an area where there could be there should be a lot more work. Um, and perhaps without more work, there shouldn't be such strong claims uh, either way. Um, I also wanted to come back to Tuya's comment about building institutions that not only look like institutions that work, but institutions that actually work. And this is a big discussion, um, certainly in development, You know, for instance, with uh, Lant Pritchett and Matt Andrews and Michael Wilcox's discussion of isomorphic mimicry. Um, and it's, a, I think, a big discussion in all, in all of our work, especially when we think about sort of measuring the things that we're trying to study. How do we capture something that, that is actually um, looking, functioning the way that we would like it to function, not only looking in terms of structure like a democratic institution or like a, like a functional uh, state. So thank you for that. I think it's something we all need to be continuing to, to focus on. Please. Oh, thank you. Well, my comment is corruption, corruption, corruption. 
kind of also answer to, to the question of, of remote places and cities and also maybe the follow-up of the aid. Also what was said recently about not not the, the, that the benefits of the countries that are helping are not getting their act together. This has been said already for 30 years. I remember when I started in the parliament, it was already a problem. There seems to be something wrong with our thinking also. Maybe it's not corruption, but maybe laziness or something that that once we have this money, we should move, take more effort already at the starting stage to, to have a closer look what we are doing together and do we also take into account anti-corruption work.